Hey guys, real quick, just wanna ask you to stick around after the end of the episode. I'm gonna be talking about my second book tour happening at the end of this month and how the profits are going to go towards Australian firefighters. Please stick around. For now, let's eat some dessert hot dogs. My dessert dogs. It's deep fried cookie dough with meringue buns, cherry ketchup, and caramel mustard. Mmm, it's dessert, but it's hot dogs, so it's good for you. Arch, I don't want to freak you out, but I think I love you. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Binging with Babish, where this week I'm walking in from the other side of the frame because I forgot to shoot my intro shot. That, and we're taking a look at Marge Simpson's dessert dogs, the genesis of which will be some hard meringue hot dog buns. We're just gonna make a super basic meringue here, separating three egg whites into the bowl of the stand mixer, picking out any shells, to which we're going to add an eighth of a teaspoon of cream of tartar before using a wire whisk to whip the whites into a foamy frenzy. About one to two minutes on medium-high speed. Make sure your pre-measured granules granulated sugar is free of lumps. And prepare your food coloring. I want a nice light brown, so I'm going with three drops each of yellow and red, and two drops of blue, which, if my days of finger painting taught me anything, should yield a nice muddy brown, which is going to be lightened up significantly when we add about a third of a cup of sugar, slowly in a nice gradual stream while the mixer runs on medium speed. Then once all the sugar is incorporated, it's time to crank this guy up to medium high speed and beat the egg whites until they reach stiff peaks. This is a good time to make any last minute changes to the color or add any flavorings that you like, an overall beat for anywhere from three to five minutes until the egg whites are smooth and glossy and satine. And of course, they hold a stiff peak. Now onto the tricky task of turning them into buns. I'm gonna bend these cannoli molds open a little bit so they stand on their own, and then cover them in aluminum foil so our meringues have a surface on which to bake. And then it's just a matter of spreading the meringue onto the mold so it resembles an inverted hot dog bun. Meringue would probably not be my first choice in making a tasty fake. I might go with something like sponge cake or brioche. Especially due to meringue's surprisingly long bake time, we need to let this go at 225 degrees Fahrenheit for two and a half hours. Make sure you do not open the oven door even after they're done. We need to let them sit in the oven until the whole oven has cooled off completely. Then once removed from the oven, they are extremely fragile, so don't be such a jock when you're taking your aluminum foil out of your meringue hot dog buns. Once you've removed the foil, set them aside until ready to use, because now we have to make our chocolate chip cookie dough hot dogs. Who writes this stuff? For this, I'm gonna make a very solid, basic cookie dough. One stick of butter, quarter cup of white sugar, three quarters of a cup of brown sugar, cream together in the bowl of a stand mixer, one large egg, mix until combined, add one cup of all-purpose flour, a quarter teaspoon of baking soda, and one teaspoon of kosher salt. Add about two, six ounces of roughly chopped bittersweet chocolate, mix to combine, and there you have it, the gold standard Toll House Special, which we're now going to mold into little saccharin Hebrew nationals. Once shaped into these kind of unfortunate looking shapes, we're gonna cover these with plastic plastic wrap and toss them in the freezer for about an hour to completely solidify, during which time we're going to make our Candyland condiments. First up, cherry ketchup. I'm starting by pitting my cherries using a single chopstick to push the pit directly out the bottom of the cherry, and then I'm placing the pitted cherries into a blender. Alternately, you could use a juicer, but the end game here is to turn these cherries into juice. Make sure you clean up all that cherry juice, otherwise it's going to stain everything you own. Then I'm going to use this blender's extract function to extract the juice from these cherries. Once it looks like a scene from your favorite horror movie, it's time to strain it into a small saucepan. Use as fine a mesh strainer or cheesecloth as you've got. Make sure you add all your harvested pits, there's a lot of good juice in there to squeeze out, and then press it through the sieve until you've got nothing left but a bunch of cherry pulp. Now it's time to cook this juice down a little bit with a couple optional tablespoons of sugar. Depends on how tart your sourced cherries were. Then once we've let everything cook together and dissolve for a few minutes, we're going to thicken the mixture with cornstarch by making a slurry out of about a tablespoon of cornstarch and a few tablespoons of cherry juice. Tiny whisk until smooth and then tiny whisk together, simmering for two to three minutes or until it's nice and thick. Then for our caramel mustard, we are combining one third of a cup of water and one cup of sugar in a medium saucepan, and then bringing to a simmer without stirring. Uh-uh, I said without stirring. All the sugar should dissolve and it should turn a lovely color of amber after about 10 minutes. At this point, we're gonna kill the heat and constantly whisk while adding three quarters of a cup of heavy cream. It's gonna spit and sputter and steam, but just be assertive and keep whisking until it's nice and smooth. Once it's cooled off for one to two minutes, add two tablespoons of butter and whisk to combine. Now you could be facing thousands of dollars in civil penalties and even jail time from the FDA if you do not salt your caramel. So make sure you season liberally with the kosher stuff lest you wish to be brought up on 
assault charges. I can actually feel all of your eyes collectively rolling to the back of your heads, and it pleases me. Last up, a light batter for our cookie dough. We've got one cup of all-purpose, half a teaspoon each of baking soda and kosher salt, and about a quarter cup of sugar, tiny whisk to combine, before adding one and one quarter cups of milk. Go ahead and stir this until not too many lumps remain. We want it to be like a really thin pancake batter, so adjust with more milk or flour as necessary. Then it's time to retrieve our cookie dough logs from the freezer and give them a batter bath. You might be asking yourself, why are we battering this cookie dough before frying, and that is to protect the chocolate from the heat of the oil, which would just melt it out and destroy it otherwise. Speaking of which, we've got one quart of vegetable oil heated to 375 degrees Fahrenheit, into which we're going to gingerly and kind of cowardly drop our logs. You could probably avoid the splatter by using a mesh spider, but I was feeling lazy. Anyway, after two to four minutes, these should emerge golden brown, crisp, and looking just like almost everything served at the Texas State Fair, but with a striking resemblance to human once broken in half, however, you'll find that this turd only contains melty chocolate and cookie dough. How's that for a tasty fake? So now that we have all of our elements ready to go, it's time to assemble. First, we're gonna place our quote-unquote hot dog delicately into our quote-unquote bun, and drizzle decoratively with both our quote-unquote ketchup and our quote-unquote mustard. And there you have it, folks, Marge Simpson's Oven Fresh Bake Off winning dessert dogs. I'll be the first to admit that they just barely look like a hot dog, but much more importantly, how do they taste? And the answer is really mostly just like cookie dough. The meringue is more sweet than flavorful, it really serves to bring texture to the party more than anything. And the cherry ketchup and caramel mustard kind of get lost in the insanity of what you're eating. And as you can see, they're very messy to eat, but all that said, they weren't bad at all. Cookie dough was delicious, the meringue was crunchy, and I almost managed to eat a whole dog before I realized what I was doing and stopped. Hey, you stuck around. Thank you very much for hanging out because I want to tell you guys about the second half of my book tour. The Binging with Babish official cookbook is on sale now, and I'm going on a second book tour at the end of this month starting in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> starting in Atlanta, Georgia, then headed to Birmingham, Alabama, Miami, Florida, Winston-Salem and Raleigh, North Carolina, and finishing in Washington, D.C. I'd love to see you guys there, and all of my profits from the book tour I'm gonna to be donating to the Western Australia Fire Service, who's one of the many organizations that are battling the horrendous wildfires in uh, Australia right now. If you can't make it to the tour, I encourage you to please, please, please donate at one of the links that I have in the video description below, the Western Australia Fire Service, the Tasmania Fire Service, uh, Red Cross of Australia, there's a lot of Ugh, going through puberty over here. There are a lot of amazing organizations doing really important work over there, and I urge you guys to give whatever you can to these people that are risking their lives to try and stop these wildfires that are ravaging Australia. Um, so please give what you can. I hope I see you on the tour, and uh, babish. Keep binging. Keep on binging. And I'll see you on the babish. And I'll, and I'll binge you till I babish you. Binging so you don't have to. Someone's got a binge. I don't have a catchphrase. I'm just realizing I don't really have a catchphrase. See you on the Tiny Whisk. I have a catchphrase. Keep cooking. I will if you will. Nailed it. <laughs>